Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Thank you for joining us. This week, we are very privileged and honored to have two guests joining the Allender Center podcast. So this week on the podcast, my friend and colleague, you should be familiar with Mr. Wendell Moss, will be hosting the podcast. He's one of our core teaching staff here at the Allender Center. You've heard from him on this very podcast and certainly throughout many of our offerings. He is also currently the manager of intercultural relations for the Seattle School, our home. And he will be joined today by special guest, Reverend Dr. Brenda Sulcher McNeil, who we have been wanting to have on the podcast for a while. She is doing incredible work on racial reconciliation. She has for many decades. She is internationally recognized for her work. She's an associate professor of reconciliation studies at Seattle Pacific University and is also the associate pastor of preaching and reconciliation at Quest Church um, in Seattle. One thing that's really special is that Wendell and Dr. Sulcher McNeil have known each other for many years as um, they met in ministry together over 20 years ago. So Dr. Sulter McNeil has recently, her book has come out, Becoming Brave. It's it's one of several books she's written, and it talks a lot about her own journey of coming to new conclusions, different conclusions about what the goal of reconciliation work is. So they're going to have a very robust conversation about their friendship, their relationship, their work on reconciliation and anti-racism work. And I just want to say this is a conversation for all of our listeners Reverend Dr. Brenda Sulter McNeil will bring some really distinct exhortations for the white church and resources and, and ways that we can be leaning into this work together. And she has incredible um, encouragement and care and resources for the Black, Indigenous, and other people of color church, community and church and our brothers and sisters. And so really grateful for the boldness and generosity of this conversation. And I think you'll find as listeners that there is something for everyone and a place for everyone to, to listen and have some action steps for how to stay committed to this work. Well, um, Brenda, I, like I was telling you, um, when I was actually invited to interview you, um, and then they told me essentially that this was a, a chance to to honor you, um, Brenda, I I really felt my heart just got full all of a sudden because me and you have been talking for many, many, many years. Many years. And so, Brenda, I don't think I've actually had the opportunity to outright sit with you, kind of talk to you, and at the same time have the privilege to honor you. Mm-hmm. From this boy, from this boy who was a freshman at Eastern Illinois University, to now a, a man who's forty-eight years old. <laughs> so, so Brenda, I, I say all that to say, Brenda, it just feels like an honor to be able to sit with you today. Um, and I promise you, I'm gonna have to. There's gonna be some moments I'm gonna have to stop. I'm gonna have to hold, hold back tears. Um, because seriously, this feels like this. We've been coming to this moment. Mm-hmm. That that's what it feels like to me. Yeah. Um, so, so how you feel as we come to this? Yeah, this, I'm ready um, to go. I just, as I said earlier, this feels so authentic. Who we are to each other is not for podcasts. It's just who we are. And so mm-hmm. the invitation was for us to have a substantive conversation about the work I do and who we are to each other, how that work and our thoughts as African-American people in the work of reconciliation, how we see it, how we interpret the world around us. We talk about that all the time. So we're just letting people in on a public, a private conversation publicly. And I'm happy to do that what? with you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Well, I, you know, Brenda, when it's come to racial reconciliation and this topic around race, Brenda, you've been doing this since I've known you. Um, I met you the first time I saw you uh, 
I, I'd heard a lot of Bon Scott, but my first real encounter with them was their band in '93. And it was, a, it was a black staff and student time gathering. And I saw you preach. And I, I remember, I remember my mouth just being in awe. And I believe you also spoke that year. And you were one of the plenary speakers at our band. And when I think I, and at the same time, this is, this is probably, this is during the Promise Keepers movement. Mm-hmm. So the topic of racial reconciliation is all over the place. And I remember hearing you speak and I had never heard anybody talk about it in the way that you did. And so I, re- I remember talking with folks afterwards and hearing a lot about you. And then shortly after that, just begin to hear more and more. And it didn't take long, Brenda, to realize that not only is this power, this woman is powerful, but this woman has been given authority. Um, the authority by Jesus in this work. And she's a and she's a voice to listen to. And, and Brenda, you have been a voice now for a long time. You, this is this is this has been your sweat and blood. Um, from when I met you to your reforming Sauce McNeil and Associates, and then coming to hone in at this is what you're gonna focus in on specifically. And and, and Brenda, I, I don't know. There there have been a lot of names, there are a lot of folks who've been talking about this. But Brenda, since I've known you. There's been very few people who has had the impact that you have, and not um, and, and we're not we're talking about the campus, not only to the campus but to the world. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just aware of your voice has been major. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do. And lest anybody thinks it's because I'm special, that's not that's not the truth. The truth is um, longevity. Uh, in this work of reconciliation is tied to the fact that this is not a good thing. It's a God thing. God is the author and the finisher of this work. I didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, you know, I think I'd like to go into reconciliation. That's not what happened. And so there's a verse for me that guides the work that I do and the life I live. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in John chapter five, verses 17 through 19, after he'd healed a man on the Sabbath who had been sick for 37, 38 years and was by the pool of Bethesda, that particular day, Jesus stops, asks him, do you want to be made well? This person, this man gives reasons why he hasn't been able to get into the pool when the water is stimulated by the spirit of God. And Jesus doesn't allow any of that to sidetrack him. He basically says, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. And instantly this man is healed. And uh, later the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders learn that Jesus is the one who's done this work on the Sabbath. It's against the rules according, according to the religious leaders. So they come and take mm-hmm. him on. And Jesus says this in, in verses 17 through 19 of chapter five in, in the book of John. He says, first of all, my father is always working. So first thing that Jesus says about this work that we are called to do is the prerequisite is to believe that God is working, that it's not because Brenda Salter McNeil got born. God is always working. And that's the presupposition that we as the people of God, the followers of Jesus, we're to come into every single situation with the belief system that God is working. And right. Right. So that's the first thing. There's a a orientation to the way we see the world around us, which is no matter where we are, God is doing something. And then our job is to stop, pause and to begin to look and see what is God doing. Right. And that's when I love being Pentecostal. I'm telling you, I grew around people who believe and some people. and, And I'm really glad we're having this conversation because 
One of the things that has changed for me is I'm standing real strongly in my blackness, in my cultural heritage without apology. Because when I got to seminary, being a Pentecostal was looked down on like, oh, that's kind of suspect, right? But the truth Mm -hmm. is that was a belief system that believes that the resurrection is true and that God is alive and well today. That God yes, is living yes. alive. It wasn't like an Easter thing that we celebrate, but a reality in which we live. God is alive and well and working every yes. day, everywhere. God is working. So I believe yes. that. And I come into my situations with that belief frame that gave was given to me from my foundation growing up in the Pentecostal church. And then Jesus says, so don't be mad at me that this guy got healed on the Sabbath. God didn't mm. take this day off. And then he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. And whatever the father does, the son does likewise. So I promise you, my longevity in this work has been a a lifelong process of following what I see the father doing. And I am in my sincere heart trying my best to do what it is I see the father doing. So I got to Occidental College. I thought I was going to specialize in women in ministry because way back in the day, that was the hot topic issue. I got to Occidental College as an intern, finishing up my seminary education, had to do my practical ed or practicum, and my practicum was at a college campus, right? I got saved on a college campus about seven or eight years prior to that. Now, all these years later, I'm giving this practicum experience on a college campus. I go to that college campus thinking I'm going to work with the women on the campus because that was what brought me to seminary. And I walk in and I see 200 college students gathering for worship, small groups, etc. And only two of those 200 were people of color. One Latino brother and an African-American young man who was dating a white young lady in the fellowship. Other than those two people, there were no other people of color in that room. And I felt like I had been caught into a time warp. I felt like from the time I was a Christian at, at Rutgers University to the time that I'm now coming to do my graduate education, so little had changed in the church when it came to the issue of race. We were as segregated then as we were now. And I thought to myself, what is it about racial reconciliation, race as an issue that is so difficult for the church to heal? Why are we so far behind in this? That question was like God tapping me on my shoulder, showing me what the father was showing me to pay attention to. I started asking that question and that question started me to to develop this ministry of reconciliation with college students like you, which is what got me on the stage at Urbana preaching to college students from all over the world because Brenda Salter McNeil was simply trying to do what I saw the father doing. And the father told me, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. It's not that there's a lack of women in this room right now. There's a lack of racial diversity in this room. What's up Uh, with that? Come on, come on. Don't push me. Don't push me. What I love what you just said, the emphasis on the fact that you are that you are doing what you see the father doing. Because one of the things that out of the many talks that we have had over the years, Brenda, is really this work is too hard if you don't believe that. That's right. That's right. Brenda, I'm hearing you say so well that the only reason that I've been able to not only enter it, but also endure the labor in this work is because you are convinced that this is what the Father is at work doing, and you are in partnership. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm not trying to prove that I'm woke. This is not a fad for me. This is not because something happened in the, in the society around me. I believe that God has called the people of God to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We're not supposed to be married to nationalism. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And it really ticks me off when I watch, watch Christians so un represent the value of the kingdom of God because yeah. it's doing a detriment to the world around us. If we could actually be the ambassadors that we're called to be and literally be stronger representatives of the kingdom of God than our denominations or our country or whatever it yes. else we allow ourselves to become our, our, our primary uh, um, way to present ourselves to the world. If we made the kingdom of God and the values of the kingdom the thing that we represent strongest in the world in which we live as sojourners, so says scripture, or pilgrims passing through, we would live differently. We would talk about things differently. We would care about different things. We would, we, yeah. we would support things in a different way. But this all starts with God. I really mean that. What yeah. God wants for the world, that's what I'm looking for. I want to see a world where the lion and the lamb lay down together. So I do care about creation. Oh, care. I do. I do believe that war and gun violence is not what God wants because the Bible says that the kingdom of God is the place where people beat their sores into plowshares, into something used for growth and fertility and, 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 and cultivating of life. That is what I preach about. That's why I'm so passionate about it. I believe that this is why we're on earth, that the people of God are here to be a microcosm of the kingdom of God. And that's really all I'm trying to do. And really what you're seeing so well on earth as it is in heaven. That's exactly right. I hear you preaching kingdom that this is about bringing forth the kingdom. That's right. Um, and, 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 and bring up what I think you are letting us know is your foundation has to be set and sure and clear on the gospel. In order to do this work, it has to be following of the Father and it has to be the kingdom. Yes, exactly. You have to be convinced of it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, uh, Brenda, thank you. Brenda, since I've been with you, I, you know, when I first met you, we were, I mean, this was uh, more than equals Chris Rice, Mr. Perkins. Uh, I mean, all these different books that, that talk so much about race reconciliation, what does it mean to, what it means to the lion lying with the lamb. But Brenda, what it, when I first entered into this conversation, there was very few people who was talking about racial reconciliation and justice at the same time. It, they almost felt like two different conversations. Racial reconciliation, and justice, and often, Brenda, I think you notice they were often talked about as opposed to one another. Oh, yeah. yeah you're talking about justice. Then now you're too radical. Justice is almost, that's not racial reconciliation. And so, Brenda, when I, when I met you, racial reconciliation is probably the, the language I most commonly heard. But, Brenda, over the, as, uh, over the years, Brenda, you shifted. <laughs> I have shifted. I really you, have. You shifted to more talking about justice. Brenda, what brought the shift? Sister? Amen. The shift? Yes, I have, brother. Yes, I have. And 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 it's getting stronger every single day. It's getting stronger yes, every single day. Because um I, I I have a quote that I have. I did I knew I was going to say it at some point, but I'm going to start with this. Okay. Audrey Lord says this, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Okay. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I think 
the great, powerful, and prolific Audre Lorde for those words. Because when Del, when we got started with reconciliation, just like you said, promise keepers, it was in vogue. People were talking about reconciliation, and then people like myself and others were asked to preach about reconciliation. But now that I look back, I realize that in the white evangelical world where we were as InterVarsity staff, um, promise keepers, there was this sense, unbeknowing to me, that reconciliation through the Christian white evangelical lens was reduced down to diversity and getting to know each other. The, the word reconciliation literally was code for we should all get along. And yes. people yes. like me were told, if you don't bring up controversial issues, you see, because the fear was that people like myself, that I had a hidden political agenda that I was trying to bring to the table through the guise of reconciliation. So really, I had like a, a motive to bring a liberal, leftist, radical, Marxist, you know, name whatever fearful word you want right. to grab, right? right? Yeah. Communist. Yeah. Or, and, and so, because who can say, you know, I'm for racism. It's just not cool. You can't say I like racism. So you can't no. say that straight up. So if I'm preaching about reconciliation, racial reconciliation, you got to kind of say, you for it because it just sounds bad to say that you're not. But then what I didn't understand was slowly but surely what white people did was say, but do it on our terms. Say it like this, not like that. Um, we could hear you better if you if you if you prove to us that this is in the Bible. You know what? If you didn't say things like um, if you didn't bring up these issues and you know what they are. So I'm going to say I'm sexuality. If you don't bring up uh, abortion, if you don't bring up gun violence, if you don't bring up any of those things. Right. Don't bring up any immigration. Don't say that because, see, that's political. If you would just talk about the Bible, see, we would hear you. And and I could almost start crying now because I did that. I, I have no hidden motive. I have no hidden agenda. I had no intention whatsoever of trying to make people think like I think or believe what I believe. I was on mission for God. And I wanted people to know as my audience that I was not coming to manipulate anybody. I'm back to where I started. I believe this is a call on the people of God to represent the kingdom of God. And so I didn't bring in any of the issues that could be perceived as me having anything other than a, a call from God to mobilize the people of God to represent the kingdom of God. And I preached my guts out. I gave everything I had. But let me tell you what I have discovered. Yes, what I now know, and, and this, I'll come back to Audrey Lord's quote in a second. This got proven to me when a white man uh, who I don't know evidently heard me speak someplace, has heard that I'm much more clear about the call to justice and reconciliation being married together. Reconciliation yes. is not this watered down, diluted kumbaya party that yes, the evangelical church has made it, where you make a statement like the Southern Baptist and you still say that you don't believe in critical race theory. So we're sorry and we're sad, but we're not going to deal with the fact that we have been complicit in the uh, dehumanization of people, of taking of their property, yes. of not yes. thinking about what might be necessary to rebuild the communities that we as a church helped people to destroy. And then we're supposed to all just get along and make friends. That's not reconciliation. That is so yes. else. So this white man said to me, and I don't know who he is. Bless his heart. Amen. Bless his heart. But on social media, <laughs> you can say things to people that you wouldn't say to their face. And he said, and I quote, we liked you better when you just quoted Bible verses. What okay. he was trying to say was, see, 
we need black people and brown people and indigenous people and Asian and Latino people to be like a speaker for our thing here and there because we feel better to show that, see, we got diversity. You spoke for us, but we only want you to speak using the kinds of things that make us feel a little bit challenged biblically, but do not think that you're supposed to name the agenda. Don't think that you're supposed to be the person who raises the solutions that you're actually calling us to embody and to give ourselves to. Just preach Bible verses. We can take a little prophetic tongue lash in and woo, that was great. But basically, we have no intention of dealing with those kinds of issues that are destroying people's lives and causing them not to reach their full God-given potential. That's what's changed for me because now I know that the master's tools will never be able to dismantle the master's house. That if in fact we as people of color are actually going to help this work of reconciliation to really make a difference in the world, we can't keep doing it on white dominant cultures terms. This is not supposed to placate people or make people feel sort of like reconciliation light. This is about changing the world. This is about causing the people of God to represent a God who is able to heal our yes, land. Ma'am. And that's what I'm doing now. So I I deleted him from my Facebook page and anybody else who's coming for me, just know that I will delete it instantaneously because I don't have any more energy to waste on those kinds of circular arguments. I'm not having it. I don't have time for it. People's lives are on the line and not just black and brown people. Wendell, I'm a college professor and you know this. I am finding more young white college students leaving the church because they see the hypocrisy and the complicity of their parents and grandparents and the Christians that they used to look up to. They don't understand this type of whiteness that they're seeing and they know that it's injustice and they don't want to be around a church like that. So I'm speaking to everybody now. The church has got to repent. We have got to turn this around. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, uh, Brenda, you know what I heard? You know what I heard from you? I, I heard, <clears throat> and it's totally all this, Brenda, I heard, I heard transformation from you. I heard you, this, this process, this has transformed you. Is that, is that a fair word, Brenda? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm calling for transformation. We're yes, supposed ma'am. to be agents of transformation. So when that guy said, we liked you better when you just quoted Bible verses, let me tell you something, what I believe about preaching. The Bible says you will no longer be conformed to this world, yes. but be transformed yes. by oh. the renewing oh. of your mind. I preach like I'm crazy because oh. I believe that the word of God can transform transform us. And if we would let the word of God do the work of the word, it would literally transform us and we would become agents of transformation. And so, and I take that word crazy back and I tell you something I've learned. There are certain words that are triggers for people and diversity includes disability. So I want to just say, I would repent of that word. I would use a different way. I preach my heart out because I'm literally preaching because I believe that the word of God can literally transform us. And I want to see transformation in the church. I want to see transformation among the people who say they're Jesus followers. Yeah. And, 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 and Brenda, that word transformation. Well, I love the focus of that word. I know even for me, Brenda, this process has changed me. It's transformed me, and it demands transformation. Absolutely, it does. And even you say this is going to take a transforming of your mind. That's right. Church, this is going to take a transforming of your mind. It will demand it. That's right. And that transformation is going to transform how you see the world around you, what you vote for, who you uh, associate yourself with, the truth you now tell, the way you use your influence. 
this type of transformation is not about making a friend and having a potluck or eating with chopsticks or speaking another language. All those things are great, but this transformation is revolutionary. This type of transformation will cause us to see ourselves like Esther, speaking yes. truth to power scared and and shaking and wondering if we're qualified, but also knowing that we can no longer sit on the sidelines and, and do and say nothing, that we're living in a time that's demanding us to be actively engaged in healing the world around us. And that's more than writing a check. That's more than crying or yes. hashtagging something. This is literal transformed lives that are trusting God to use us to become agents of transformation in the places we find ourselves. Yes, ma'am. And, and Brenda, what you're making me think about, because I remember as a college student, as I was talking about racial reconciliation on campus, I remember talking about it in a way that won't get me, that won't get me in trouble. That, that, that won't get me, that won't get me care. That will make everybody feel okay. And so to talk about justice just felt, it just felt dangerous. Yes, and and, and, you, and you use that word uh, earlier, like comply. Like that was that there was a sense of a of, of complicity of of what what probably the, the white evangelical church wanted in talking about racial reconciliation. That's right. And, and so, Brenda, I, I'm not, I was just talking with Sister Linda Royce yesterday, and and I still grieve that. I still, I still grieve that. But yet, that makes me even more grateful for the transformation that is that is that is that has taken place. Yeah. And being able to finally be able to tell the whole story. To tell the whole truth, which is what you are saying so well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, but now we're talking about a more robust gospel. Exactly. And you know what I would say, Wendell, I'm not sure. I hear you saying I grieve it. And I, 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 I think that it's been a journey, right? Reconciliation is a process. It's a journey. And I think that we have stayed on the journey long enough that people can see, even we can see ourselves, our own evolution, our own yes. transformation. Yes. And so yes. I think we were right in, in our earlier time, years of working at this to assume that if we met people halfway, you know, mm -hmm. that if we, you know, didn't say all that we felt from our black African-American experience, but tried to, yeah. you know, learn how to ebb and flow. Um, uh, we live in a racialized society and almost everything we've done, going to college, going to graduate school has been yeah. interwoven with whiteness. We wouldn't be where yes. we are in life if we hadn't learned how to navigate this world. Oh, dang, right? <laughs> we we got to, we, we, we have a, <laughs> and how to understand white dominant culture and how to succeed in it. We wouldn't be where yes. we are had we not learned to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I think though, now what's happened for me is yes, I feel like had that worked, I'd still be doing it. If I thought that doing it on white dominant cultures terms would have produced the type of racial healing, the type of equity and 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 the type of uh kingdom values where we say we're pro-life and yeah. and we're pro-life on certain things, but we don't care when that life is an innocent person whose children have been taken away from them and 600 and some children still cannot be reunited with their families. And I can't imagine a mother or father whose infant was taken away from them and two years later they have never seen their baby. They don't know what's happening to the baby. And the baby was too young when taken from the parent to even know how to recognize their own mom and dad if they ever get to see them again. That is tragic. And so I am all for a person being pro-life. But to be, say yeah. that you are pro-life and not care about those children, you see there's a problem there. 
there's a problem there. And so that's what's caused me to say what white evangelical Christians or white Christians, and I'm being really straight here, I'm serious about this, it's been white people who told us that we do reconciliation on their terms. And if we were to do it on their terms, we would, we would, we would embrace this message of reconciliation. Well, in 2016, when I watched the presidential election of a person who clearly stated some very, very harmful things about people of color, about the disabled, about women, right? Who had all of this and Christians, 81% of Christians said, you know, this is just fine with me. That's okay. We want this kind of person. We want this kind of rhetoric. That was the huge aha. I mean, catalytic event for me was yes. the, 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 the clarity that 30 years of my life of preaching based upon what white evangelical Christians said, if you do it this way, this will lead to reconciliation. That proved to me that that was not true. That proved to me that what would happen is we'll listen to you and yeah, we'll hire you and we'll have you come. We feel better when you come. You're such a nice person, but we're not going to change anything. And fundamentally, we still have the exact same belief system and, and worldview that we had before you preached. And then I began saying what Roger, Roger Lord says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So now I'm asking white evangelicals to not tell me what to do. How about you listen to us? How about you allow us this time to tell you on what terms we should approach this work? Because those whose people, whose lives are being impacted by these policies, be impacted by the lack of racial justice. We know better than anyone else what it would take to bring racial healing. So how about white evangelicals and white Christians? And if I'm talking to you, I mean it. It's your turn to be humble. It's your turn to listen to people on the on the margins, people of color. It's your turn to say you have an expertise, an insight that we don't have. And this time we're going to stop assuming that we know the solution and we're going to trust our brothers and sisters of color to lead the way this time. This issue is yours to lead. We need your expertise on what racial reconciliation really means. Brenda, I, I, I can't help but just stop my go here. Brenda, as you have as you have just prophetically just spoken to to to, to the white church. Brenda, when I down in Montgomery, I remember doing a seminar on racial trauma. And I remember remember making a statement how racial trauma, nobody escapes it. And I specifically said, not even my white brothers and sisters escape it. And Brenda, I remember I this uh, one of my this white brother puts, raised his hand and he just had this look on his face. And there was a sense of how can how can you say that? I'm right. This is this is this racial trauma only happens to folks of color. How in the world has this possibly impacted me? How does how does that work? And and when I ex, I, I, sh- I remember sharing about three or four points, but there was just this look of I've never heard someone talk to me about how racism and racial trauma even affects me as a white person. And Brenda, what you have just put words to, I, I, that makes me wonder. So Brenda, when we think about, when we think about the white community, what's the, what's the gospel of reconciliation for the white community, Brenda? I think, you, I think you're messing with it already. Yeah, that make sense? yeah, it does make sense. I've got a few things to say. We each community has its own work uh, and needs in specific seasons. In this season, yes. the white church, the white Christians, non-Christians, the white community literally has to dismantle whiteness. We didn't create whiteness. I mean, James, James Baldwin is right. I am not your Negro. <laughs> that brother meant that I am not your Negro. So the real question is, why did you have to create one? 
because uh-huh. race is not a biological construct. It's a sociological construct. And it was created by people who needed a racial hierarchy. We needed a racial hierarchy of human difference so that some people would be superior and other people would be deemed inferior. You must integrate, interrogate that. You must dismantle that and you must ask yourselves, what's up with us? Where does that come from and what has it done to hurt us? How has it dehumanized us? People used to have a belief system that you were English, that you were German, that you were Polish, that you, you know, you had an ethnic identity that you could delve yes. into. You could understand the struggle of your own ethnic origins. And yeah. somewhere along the line, it became more politically expedient to bring all those people together and become white. It is time to deconstruct that. Because when you dehumanize others, you dehumanize yourselves. That's what you were saying to that man in your seminar on racial trauma. It is having a a negative impact on the souls of everybody who has come under this uh, false narrative of a racial hierarchy of human difference. And white people have got to take responsibility for that interrogate how it has damaged their own sense of identity and do the hard work of reconnecting to the truth of the narrative of who you are. That's the work that white Christians need to be facilitating in churches all over this country. So don't ask me about my story another day. I don't want another person to say, I just want to know more about you. I know about myself. I'm going to work on my story. You should work on your story. So there's some books to help you. Daniel Hill, White Awake. Another book by Daniel Hill, White Lies. And a book by uh, David Swanson called Rediscipling the White Church. I am a mentor to those two white pastors and they are beasts at what they do yes. and white yes. folks don't read nothing else about black people or brown people you go read about white people it's your turn to do your work yes I feel like preaching Bring all them. of a sudden don't push yes, me no. <laughs> look, look, and, and see what you're preaching, Brenda, and what I would want every white person here in this episode is that whiteness has taken away your face it's true Say it again. It has, it, it has taken away your face. I want y'all to pause and see that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This narrative of racial difference is, is it is truly, and we can see it now in our country. Mm-hmm. I have never seen our country in a more divided uh, frightened, potentially hostily, hostile and volatile time. This is the first time in my lifetime that I've seen this. But this this is the outcome of of decades of this type of thinking that goes unchecked, unrepented of, unconfessed. And we keep trying to put a bow on it and make it sound good. We got to stop that. Uh-huh. Really. And in my class, uh, my students and I read a book by Jamar Tisby, yeah. The Color of Compromise. Uh-huh. And if you read the complicity of the church with with racism and injustice, it is it's been ongoing since the inception of our country. And we can't we got to tell the truth. Again, I'm back to the Bible. The Bible promises us that the truth will make us free. And so we got to call a thing a thing. It's time for us all to tell the truth. And so people think that I've become like mean or more bold or something. I'm just trying to tell the the truth. truth. And that's that's all all I'm doing. I used to kind of pull it back a little bit. And now I'm just telling the truth because I truly believe that the truth will make Make us free. free. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I do. Man. Brenda, I'm thinking thinking about brown and black folks. Um, we're tired. Brenda, we, Brenda, we're weary. I am. I mean, you have talked enough. You are too. Mm-hmm. Again, hence, we better know that the Father is doing this. Oh, it's over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Brenda, when you think, when you think, when you think about our faces, when you think about brown faces, red, yellow. Yeah. 
Brenda, what do you want to say to us? Yes, to my siblings, those of us who embody diversity and reconciliation in the very skin that we're in. We can't not be a part of the conversation because our bodies are doing work in this racialized society, whether we want them to or not, you know, um, and so really, I, I was doing something at my local church and a couple of the people, one Latina and another sister who's from the continent of Africa, um, said, you know, I don't want to be on the diversity team. I, every time the word diversity comes up, it's always assumed that those of us who are people of color have got to be on the diversity thing. And we're tired. And that's straight up real and that's valid. And so the first thing I would say to us, we are living in a, uh, and this is your expertise, uh, Wendell, we're living in a racially charged, traumatic environment right now. I've never seen a president who will not concede. I've never seen people coming to the governor's office with um, automatic weapons threatening to kill the sitting governor. This is scary. And the church, let me just say, this is where the whole church, the white church should decry this. But every Christian should say, we don't go to the governor's office with us with guns. But when when silence is violence. So when white people, Christian and otherwise, let that happen and don't say anything about it, but then say, you know, they were looting in the streets in Seattle. I just feel like, oh, so looting in the streets bothers you. But these people with AK-47s going to kidnap the governor and kill her, that don't matter to you. Now, do you hear something wrong with that? I do. I do. I I hear something wrong with that. So I feel like I'm not going to say one thing to these young people out in the street, if you're not going to say something to these grown people with assault weapons, th- killing people and threatening to kill people, that should be something that we are all on the same page about. This is not about gun control. This is about people literally walking down the street with assault rifle- rifles and we let it go. This, this is the kind of stuff that's hypocritical. Right. And this is the kind of stuff that feels traumatic in my body. This is the kind of stuff that when I hear about Ahmaud Arbery going for a jog, a young black kid going for a jog, 30 years old. And, you know, my son, you were there when I when I was pregnant with my baby. You've known me before I had children. So can you imagine Omari going for a jog, literally just going for a run or you going for a run and you stop to look at a house that's been under construction and you're wondering how it's coming along and people in that neighborhood shoot and kill my son. What? Everybody should say, God forbid that shouldn't happen to anybody's child, regardless to what color they are. But when white Christians stay silent about that, yes, it feels doubly traumatic in the yes. body of my brown yes. brother. Because it says to me, my baby is under threat for simply jogging in the skin he's in. He has nothing. He didn't do anything wrong. And somebody took it upon themselves to shoot that woman's child. Not good. Horrifying. So for my brothers and sisters who are from various communities of color, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Your need to renew yourself, to recharge yourself, to reconnect with God and people who love you. And when they look at you, they look at you with love in their eyes. They see beauty every time they see your face. You need to be in that kind of a healing space. And so I thank you so much, Wendell, for recommending to me my grandmother's hands oh. and resma mannequin. That's what black and brown folks need to be doing. Right now, we need to be reading things that affirm our identity. I really do mean that. And I'm even going to include in that people whose gender identity is not of the dominant culture. And I say that to say this, we have to stop somehow believing that it's okay for some people to be traumatized and other people not. It's not okay for anybody to be traumatized, whether we agree with them or not. All people are made in the image of God, no exceptions, and no one should feel a sense of trauma just by being. Yes, and ma'am. so I, I really 
I would say our work right now is to protect ourselves, to pray, to find places of joy, drink water, <laughs> you know, do yoga, find ways to, to really take good, good, good care of yourself. Because this pandemic has a second um, effect of keeping us from being able to be in some of those spaces where we did find that kind of connection, that kind of care for each other. So find it, seek it out. And then the other thing I would say is this, and, and I'm, I know it's time for us to get ready to close, but I'll say decenter whiteness. If I've done anything, I have come to know that we have spent far too much time going around and around in circles trying to convince the white church to listen to us or white people to hear us. I'll say Black Lives Matter. Don't all lives matter? Now, I can tell you this. I am not having that debate another day. I am absolutely Understood. done. I am done answering that question because nobody is trying to suggest that all lives don't matter. What we are saying, and I'm not even going to try to explain it, is that there are times that we have to identify where the problem lies and begin to focus on that, period. Jesus you know? left the 99 to 10 to 1. Period. Good, good example. Exactly. So, so I'm done. I'm absolutely done. Right. What I think as people of color, we should do is stop using slash wasting so much of our time begging white people to listen to us. I think that what we can do is use our agency and our authority and our expertise to be in community with ourselves and others who are asking forward thinking questions. You see, there are conversations that we can have, Wendell, with people around the world who literally want to hear our story of resilience. Yes. I'll never forget when Derek and I went to England for the first time. We oh, were seminary yeah. students, oh, right? Yeah. And and Dr. Bill Pinnell took us to England to lecture on the black church in America. And I, and we went to Oxford. We were at Oxford, right? And I was just like, people want to hear us talk about the black church. They took notes on us and we were still seminary students. Because the Anglican church in England, and I think that this is still true today, but was going through a serious period of decline where more pe more churches were closing their doors because they didn't have enough people who were coming to churches in the way that they had in the past. And the reason that this was happening was because of industrialization and multi-ethnicity coming more into cities like London and other places, right, where the church was not built with those people in mind. And so when a church ceased to be a church, it was called a redundant church. It was in the state of redundancy. Amen, somebody. Because if we don't have redundant churches in the United States, too, I don't even know. Right. We have redundant churches who exist for themselves and they actually are not doing anything but being redundant over and over and over again. And the Oxford Center for Missiological Studies wanted to interview people whose churches had learned to thrive in the midst of changing demographics graphics where the urban environments brought in greater diversity, greater in industry, and still was able to continue to grow. And they found that the Black Church in America was one such congregation or, or organization, Christian organization <laughs> that seemed to thrive. And that's why they were so interested in our story. So to my brothers and sisters of color, I will tell you that there's a world waiting to hear your story. We can have conversations with afro Brazilians. We can have conversations with Afro-Haitians. There are yes. people whose children are being taken away from them at the border. And we have a history of knowing through slavery what it is to have children who have been taken from their parents violently. We can be in solidarity with that conversation. Yes. And together we can move forward on healing our land. And we don't have to wait to get permission from our white brothers and oh. sisters and the communities around us to give us permission to do that. We can go ahead and lead and be the people of God who are on mission for the kingdom of God and we don't need their permission to do it. So let's go. <laughs>
from Brenda. The folks are, the folks of color who are hearing who are hearing this podcast. I, I, do you hear? Do you hear? Do you hear? Do you hear? I ain't, I ain't gotta. I don't have to ask you. Amen. Amen. There's a world waiting for us, I promise you. And it's time for us to take our prophetic place on the landscape of history. It's our turn. And there's a world, not just a country, there's a world waiting to hear our perspective. New Zealand, Australia, the Aboriginal community, (laughs) South Africa. When I went to Kenya, the young people wanted to talk to me about African-American stories. And I'm telling you, and it's not just the academics. They want to talk to beauticians. They want to talk to cosmetologists. They want to talk to people who take pictures and photography artists. They want to hear people whose music. We have got an international opportunity if we would dare to stop centering whiteness. And Brenda, nobody is telling us, nobody is telling us that we have a story for you. Nobody is telling us that. That we have, you're telling telling me, you're telling us that we have a story for the world. And not only that, but you are saying that the world is waiting for us. Amen. They want to know, why won't we come? Why won't we share? And so let's decolonize our own minds. Let's decide that we don't need permission. We can take the reins now and know that our story, our resilience, your expertise in racial trauma, this this is not just unique to us. This is happening around the world. But we have a resilience. We have made something out of nothing. We have defied odds and still we rise, says Mother. Maya Angelou. So come, come on. on. Come on. Bring. Come on. Let's come go. On, this is something that the world wants to hear. This is necessary. And anybody and everybody can join the party, but we're not waiting for you. So if this is our white brothers and sisters listening, yes, join this kingdom family, but join this kingdom family and learn how to listen, how to amen, sit at the feet of people whose lives have given them the unique profession prophetic authority to speak about these things and learn from us and join us. But let us lead this time. This is the time that is time for the people of color who have been positioned for such a time as this to be the Esters in the room in Jesus. Come name. on now. Come on. Bec- come on. Becoming brave. Look. <laughs> That's right. Nobody would have picked Esther to be the next queen, but God uses the simple things of this world to confound the wise. Yes. It's our turn. I can feel it in my spirit and I mean it. Yes. This is our turn. And if we would step up and step out, speak up and speak out, we've got something to say. Yes, ma'am. And for y'all wondering who wondering why I said Becoming Brave, that is that is my that is Mama Brenda's latest book, Becoming Brave. Go get it. Please go get it. Let me make one final shift. And we're about to and this is and this this is this is personal. Um but I've been having a hard time not crying in this whole thing because I saw I'm sitting here talking to you. Brenda, again, me and you refer to this all the time. We refer to 96, or Band 96 all the time. Where we had your, one, of your, one of your Latina prayer warriors pray over us in 96 and had the audacity to prophesy that you and I would be still together in the future, that I would know your kids. I'm just graduating from college. And and I remember when she prayed that and said that I remember feeling excited, but also how is this going to happen? And so when I shifted, shifted again and then again, then it kind of came this thing up. Okay, how is this still going to happen? Okay, was somebody feeling good at the moment? And then all of a sudden, I get a phone call in two thousand. Y'all moved here? 10, 2010, 11. Then I get a phone call saying, we coming to Washington State. And me, we've kept in touch over the years. 
in between that game. I still come back and saw you Chicago, but then you step back boldly into my space. And your and your husband even becomes my boss. Brenda, I so that, that prophecy in 96 just became real. And and I'm just reminded, Brenda, that every conference, every time I speak, even as somebody who does racial trauma, Brenda, that all started with me learning from you. And but I but I think there's also the sense of I've always felt in partnership with you, even even by geographically apart. You know, there's just kind of those relationships we just kind of so we always don't begin where we left off. There's a bond in the in the ministry partnership that won't snap. I mean, I we went from you had a big part of me coming on university staff. Ending the Black Student Conference in Chicago called Vision, you have passed a baton on to me to do that. And in fact, really, you passed me many batons. And and I've been in your life for a long time. And so it's not enough to say thank you, but I just. What's it? What's I mean? What's it been like to have a freshman to a forty-seven, forty-eight-year-old man? Yeah, still be. Well, I tell you two things. First of all, for everybody listening, I love Wendell Moss. Period. He's like a son to me, and um, you don't go looking for these things. We're back where we started, right? This is yeah. something that the father has done. Yeah, it wasn't like I said. Let me go pick myself somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I believe that this is as a relationship that God has brought. And I'll tell you what I've learned from you. And I want to end with this. Yeah. I what you've described is something I've been doing th- for over 30 years. Right. But I didn't have language for it. But I believe that each of us should clarify our mission and our purpose, because once you have that beacon light in front of you, it guides you and keeps you on the path of the thing that God God has called you to do. So my purpose, my mission is to inspire and empower the next generation of Christian leaders to be practitioners of reconciliation in their various spheres of influence. So Wendell, I didn't have language for it way back then in the 90s, but what you saw me do then is what God has given me for language for now. Mm -hmm. I'm called to pass on everything that I have to the next generation of Christian leaders. I'm supposed to inspire you and empower you so that you can take your rightful place and lead from your place of strength and influence. And if I have done that, I have done my job, my purpose for being on this earth. So may God bring the fruit of your life and the fruit of many lives. It's my honor to invest in you because that's what God has called me to do. Brenda, I'm so I'm honored to tell you. And I will end with this, Brenda. Thank you for your words here, but here specifically for me. All this is 20, this is 25 years. Thank you. Dan and I are really excited. Uh, We are going to do a conference that we're calling From Conflict to Connection on February 6th. So it's perfect right before Valentine's Day. So maybe you actually have a chance of having a good, connected, sweet Valentine's Day versus one that's embedded in conflict. Or conflict that actually opens the door to an even more wild and wonderful Valentine's Day. So Kathy, how is your life of conflict? It's amazing. Thank you for asking. How is yours? Uh, You know, let's just say uh, most of the time, uh, conflict between Becky and I or with others, including you and me, oftentimes conflict feels like it's going to divide us and I or others end up defending. And you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. Really? Tell me more, Dan. (laughs) Now, are we in conflict? (laughs) I think conflict is one of the most terrifying things 
because it ends up being a ghost that we kind of slip into the realm of and then and then you're swimming in a milieu that feels like it's an undercurrent that just takes you down without a whole lot of a sense of how you got there and how to get out. I think I think conflict is scary for most of us and yet conflict is actually the thing that can redeem more of our brokenness, more of where we're frightened can bring more hope into relationship if we understand how we handle conflict, how our conflict impacts other people around us, and how our conflict is directly connected to our stories of heartache from our past. Yeah, I mean, bottom line, look, what we're hoping to do is to invite people, whether they're married, whether they're dating, uh, partnered, or just, look, conflict is inevitable living east of Eden. And the fact is, it, it exposes us uh, almost inevitably. Conflict always exposes something about who we are, what we want, what we're afraid of. And it either leads us to being in one sense connected uh, through a process of humility, or it divides us and we go back to the word defense. Isn't that wonderful? So come and join us. We'd be, uh, it'd be a pleasure to have you. This conference is really for anyone and everyone who's in the midst of relating to one another. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.